All right, greetings students. Uh, thank you for joining me on this uh, brand new lecture. I haven't done uh, one of these video lectures in probably close to a year. Um, uh, ran through 60 or 70 of them during COVID and just kept going. Um, but uh, I'm now teaching an online learning program coming this September and I thought it was advantageous to give students a lesson on uh, approaching uh, you know, writing, particularly in the fields of social studies and English. Um, I must admit for myself, uh, you know, I haven't been to high school since the middle 1980s, but I recall very distinctly that when I finished uh, high school and made my way into college before I went into university in third year, I made, it was made very painfully aware to me that I really didn't have a good grasp on writing. Now, in saying that, it doesn't mean so much that the high school teachers were not doing their job at the time, probably wasn't paying as close attention as I uh, could have to uh, the lessons when it came to writing. But either way, in my first semester of college, I took a, uh, a, a writing course, a composition course, which was required for everyone. And boy, in hindsight, I sure am thankful that I did because I learned so much. It was the first time that I'd taken a course that was focused strictly on writing. And, you know, the other piece, too, uh, aside from all the instruction you can get about writing, I'm a big believer that in order to be an effective writer, you have to be an active reader. Many of the students I've worked with over the last near 25 years now, I've seen a certain pattern that a lot of the kids that seem to have a natural aptitude to writing that just are, are, are quite comfortable with the format and can write in-class essays very, very effectively, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, are generally good readers. So, uh, now what's the correlation? You know, that's a whole other <laughs> lecture, but at the end of the day, I think when you're reading, although you're not paying attention to the details of sentence structure, and uh, persuasion and things like that, you are absorbing good strategies of writing, especially when you're reading a great piece of literature. It just flows off the page and you're completely consumed by it. You're consumed by it not just because it is a great story, but because it's well written. And we absorb these things. So uh, if you are not an active reader, I would say that's probably the number one way to become a better writer. You know, find things that you like uh, when it comes to reading. If you like sports, read sports magazines. If you like music, read biography, uh, you know, or wh whatever. Find whatever it is that um, interests you and try to engage a little bit more in active reading. So, either way, what I want to do and what I hope to do is to give my online learning students the opportunity to, uh, to work through this lecture so that they can be prepared for the essays that you'll be writing specifically for me in my classes. Keep in mind that there are a multitude of ways in which writing can be taught. And it can be a little overwhelming as an instructor when you're looking at different techniques and different uh, uh, styles of, of teaching and, and, and uh, assessing how kids learn and so forth as to how to approach this process. And what I've done here is I've boiled down a technique in a way that is, should be understandable to everyone. I have actually encouraged my uh, social studies department over the last 10, 15 years to, to, to scaffold our writing. That is what kids do in nine, build on what they do in 10, which builds on what they do in 11, and then 12. So that we're all kind of doing the same thing. We're encouraging students and we're reinforcing it every grade level, so there's continuity there. So. What I hope is that uh, you walk away from this kind of at least getting an understanding of how to approach writing. Many of you put a pen to paper and you just don't know for the life of you where to begin. I'm hoping that will change. Okay? Anyway, so let's proceed. So while this lecture will focus predominantly on uh, persuasion and, and approaches for uh, historical writing, I will make reference to a variety of uh, uh, types of writing in literature in English as well. Expository writing is basically the idea of giving thorough background to a topic. So for example, if you were going to write uh, an, an essay on the origins of um, Christmas, 
you give all that background knowledge that explains where it came from and how it developed over years. Same thing if you were doing something about Thanksgiving, you would talk about all the history behind what led us in Canada and the United States as well to celebrate what we call Thanksgiving. So there's not necessarily, you know, you may not necessarily have a thesis as such, it's more just describing and telling about something that prepares them for an understanding of a topic, giving background information. The next one that I think most students are the most comfortable with would be narrative writing. And what that basically means is that you are telling a story. And in this type of writing, you can refer to yourself as I, you know, I went to the store, I saw this, we got together and went to the park, so on and so forth. Referring um, to yourself and to, uh, you know, in the first person, okay? Uh, storytelling is the best way to think of it. Now, when other pieces of writing, for the most part, uh, first person is discouraged, although I must admit when I completed my master's program, um, uh, my final project, I was able to use first person, which was really quite a revelation to me because it had been quite a gap between when I did my master's and when I did my BA. And there was quite a significant shift, obviously, where I could refer to myself. And, and I did, and I did very well on it. But either way, um, that would be something that you would want to be aware of when you go to post-secondary. And, and each of your professors in college and university will likely clarify their expectations for writing as well. So, Okay, so storytelling. Number three, descriptive. All this means is that you are using your main senses to describe a setting. So for example, if I give you a topic Tell me about the most beautiful day and beautiful surroundings you can imagine. You're going to tell me this, you're going to explain, describe this setting by using your senses of what you see, what you hear, what you taste, and what you smell, right? Sensory perception, using this, the, explaining how your senses are um, interacting with your environment, okay? Pretty straightforward. Compare and contrast, I don't do as much anymore, but basically those of you that have done Venn diagrams, that would be a, a, a graphic organizational strategy in preparation for a co compare and contrast essay. That's the one with the two circles and the middle overlaps. The middle you would talk about how they're similar and on the other side you talk about how they're different. So usually, you know, two things that you're comparing and you're showing their differences and their similarities. Persuasive writing or persuasion is the central form of writing that you will be utilizing in a history class. And for most of you that are doing Social Studies 11 or 20th Century World History 12, <coughs> uh, or Social Stand for that matter, and others, you will be dealing with persuasion. Okay? And basically what persuasion means is that you are going to convince your reader, in this case your teacher, uh, that your position on a topic is correct by using convincing language, by backing up your thesis in a way that, that uh, is, uh, is very convincing. Ultimately, that's what you want to do. We're going to get into the details of that after. So, one of the central um, formats of teaching writing that we've used, that I've used, uh, is basically the five paragraph model. Most of you by grade 11 will be familiar with this format. Um, keep in mind that the five paragraph model is simply a formula to help students understand the structure of writing. When you get to post-secondary and you're doing 1500 or 3000 word essays, the five paragraph model goes out the window. However, the process and the procedure of putting your thoughts together in a linear sequential fashion remain the same. Now, for some teachers, you know, multi-paragraph can mean three. Basically what you're looking at is every essay should have an introduction, every essay should have a body, or three body paragraphs, or many more body paragraphs, and a concluding paragraph. So, intro, body, conclusion. Okay. Um, so, in that case, I've had many students write really, really strong, clear, 
uh, three paragraph essays. That's completely fine in the high school level. As long as you understand that when you move up to the next level of education, it's going to get quite a bit more. Uh, there's going to be quite, <laughs> quite a few more paragraphs involved and more words as well. High school classes in English and Social Studies generally teach the five paragraph model, as I mentioned. Uh, just before as a framework, but many teachers introduce essay writing in a three paragraph format. So for you, all of my students will be writing essays uh, for each unit and then you can come to me because you'll have to come to the class to write the test and we can clarify these things so we can talk more about it if you want to touch base about is there any advantage over writing a five paragraph or a three paragraph and things like that. So we can talk about that. One of the biggest problems students have with writing is they put pen to paper and they say, well, I've got to write an essay. They know the content, but they simply just don't know how to organize their thoughts. That is the single biggest roadblock for students when it comes to effective writing. So I am a big fan of pre-planning pre-writing activities and there's a variety of ways that you can do that. So we're going to look at a couple here and then I'll talk about the pre-writing activity that you'll be doing with me in my classes. Students will be required to map out their essay in an outline form before they write. In some cases we might even, that might even be an assignment where you're going to, you're going to be given a graphic organizer, you're going to be instructed how to use it and you're going to hand that in for marks and I will look at it, I will comb through it, I'll make comments, and then I'll give it back to you, and then you can bring that with you when you write your in-class essay. So, uh, very, very important outlining. Some people like to draw pictures. You can have diagrams. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not one of these who are saying, you have to do it this way. If there is another way that you've used in terms of a pre-writing activity that works for you, please let me know and I'm happy to accommodate, right? Because ultimately I just want you to be thinking about your writing before, I want you to be planning things out so that when you put pen to paper, you've got a framework with which you can uh, follow. A lot of you use webs, you know, the circles with the lines and then this circle with two lines and two circles and how things are connected. That Webbing is a very uh, common and effective way of organizing your thoughts. Some people like good old-fashioned point form. Um, there's nothing wrong with that either. Once again, remember, there's many, many different ways that you can plan out your writing. Uh, and as I say, there's no absolute right or wrong way. What works for one person may not work for somebody else. Graphic organizing, and this is what we will be looking at uh, uh, in the next slide, where I'm going to show you, I think it's the next slide, or the next couple, either way, that show you the graphic organizer that I will be giving you in, uh, in preparation for the essays you'll be writing in my classes as well. Okay. <clears throat> the next part is, and probably the biggest roadblock for students, is how do I start this thing? What do I say in my introduction? You know, and many, many, I tell you, for, for over 20 years, I've, I've grappled with a variety of different methods for teaching writing. And, you know, where I'm at now is sort of, uh, you know, years and years and years of, of, of reinventing the wheel, so to speak, in a way to make it understandable and clear for my students. And over the last 10 years or so, I've used this topic thesis sequence model and all of you will be using this model in the class the social studies department in my school for the most part is using this model as well so as we talked about we've we've scaffolded our writing at my school so that there's consistency across grades what does this mean this model is intended to give clear guidance to the beginning writer okay pretty straightforward number one the topic is what you are writing about Napoleon is a topic. World War II is a topic. Communism is a topic. It can be a person, it could be a place, it could be an event. The topic is simply what you are writing about, right? The Nuremberg Trials, a topic. You know, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, topic, okay? Topic, what you are writing about. The thesis, before I 
read it and, and go into greater detail, students oftentimes confuse the topic and thesis as the same thing. And I'm not sure where that comes from and why I've seen that over the years, but a lot of students seem to think a thesis is a topic. A thesis is a position you are taking on a topic. It's good, it's bad, it's right, it's wrong. And it's, it's, it's the thesis is what you will be defending in your essay, okay? It's the position you will take on the topic which you will defend in your essay. The sequence means the three main ideas, and we're going to stick with three, and as I said, when you get to post-secondary, it's going to expand, but for the purposes of continuity, for the purposes of understanding how to do this, um, we're going to stick with the three main points, okay? So basically, uh, the three subtopics are going to back your thesis, which is going to support your topic. So I'm going to give an example next on the American Revolution, but let me just throw this out here. Let's go with an obvious one. Let's say you're writing on Adolf Hitler. That's your topic, Adolf Hitler. And you've surmised or determined that he was a brutal dictator. Well, there were no shocker there. Um, but then you might grapple over, well, I can't, that can't be my thesis because it's, it's been said so many times. That doesn't matter. It, it, it's not about coming up with something that nobody has ever said. Right? Your thesis is simply a strong position that you're going to defend. So if Hitler's your topic and that he was a brutal dictator is your thesis, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? Um, then your sequences would be three subtopics that demonstrate why and how he was a brutal dictator. You know, he implemented the enabling laws in 1933 and, and um, eliminated civil liberties. He, uh, he, he perpetrated a, a, you know, a, a genocide against the Jewish people and he caused great destruction in Europe, whatever it might be. Now the key with your sequence paragraphs is that they need to be broad enough that you can give lots of detail. Okay, so to revisit, topic, what you're writing about, thesis, the position you're taking on the topic which you will defend in your essay, and your sequence are your three main subtopics that will support the thesis and defend it. Okay, topic, thesis, sequence. Pretty straightforward. Okay, here's an example of something of how it could work. Now, before we get into this, let me take that off. I want to be clear here about your introduction. For our purposes, we will be writing, starting with one sentence introductions. We will get into the hook. We will get into all that. But what I want to see is that you can construct a strong one sentence introduction that has those three elements, a topic, a thesis, and a sequence. If you have achieved that, you are golden, right? At that point, then you can, then you can fill it up with a great hook at the beginning, right? And, and, and all those other techniques that we use predominantly in English as well of, of having a strong introduction. For me, one sentence introduction is just fine. Okay, let's pretend we're talking about the American revolutionaries. The American revolutionaries are going to be my topic of this essay. Now I need to take a position on them. So that would be my topic. My thesis could be, might be, we're justified in rebelling against Britain. That's the position I've decided to take, that the, the American revolutionaries were justified in rebelling against Britain. Now in saying that, you could make an equally compelling argument that said they were not justified in rebelling against Britain. For me as an instructor, I'm not interested in marking you based on your point of view. You don't need to go, I don't think Mr. Tolman will agree with that position. That should be the last thing on your mind. I am not here to, to judge you based on your position. What I'm judging is do you have a good, do you have a topic, do you have a clear thesis, and do you have a well-developed series of sequence paragraphs. That's all I'm worried about, that you've defended your argument clearly and constructively. You know, my position is to teach you how to write, you know, not, not what to write about, 
you know, or what to back up and what to believe. And that's something that you need to figure out. My job as an instructor is to give you information, to give you different points of view, teach you critical thinking, hopefully, and, and you find your own voice, okay? Now, you came to me and your topic was the Holocaust and you said it never happened. That's a problem. You know, that would be something where you'd have to say, look, you know, <laughs> there are lines in the sand of, of bias. But if you said, you know, Lenin of the Russian Revolution was a great leader, you could make a case there. You could make an equally good case that Lenin was a terrible leader, right? So whatever it might be. Um, so don't ever feel constrained by what I, f what I might feel, because that's not relevant at all. You need to learn how to write. You need to, to develop confidence. And that's what you need to worry about. Okay, so topic, American revolutionaries. Thesis, they were justified in rebelling against Britain. Now I need three reasons. Number one, sequence one, they were deprived of Western settlement, right? Um, so they were not able to move west because of treaties uh, with the French and the British and others. Number two, they were made to pay taxes without consent. Okay? No taxation without representation becomes, you know, the, the, the calling card of the revolutionaries. Number three, threatened with violence if they did not submit or do what they were told. Okay. The key with these three topics is that they have to be broad enough that you can give ample explanation because you're going to want at least three to five, three to seven well-developed sentences in your body paragraphs, right? So you, you don't make your sub- topic sequence so specific that you can't say too much about it. Keep it relatively open so you can give details. Okay? Now once you've done this, right, and you will, you'll do this on the graphic organizer we'll look at next, let's put those into a sentence and, and, and see how it rolls from there. So this is how, what I would do. It's basically just crunching all this together. There's no, no surprises here. Now this is one sentence, okay? And I would call this a very, very clear um, introduction. One sentence. Here we go. The American revolutionaries were completely justified in rebelling against Britain because they were deprived of Western settlement, they were made to pay taxes without consent, and they were threatened with violence if they did not submit. That is clear. It's to the point. It does everything you need it to do. Okay? Now, if you were going to have a hook, you would put that before, right? usually a broad general statement that introduces your topic and thesis. For our purposes, we're going to focus on this. One sentence intro introduction. If you're doing a piece of literature, now I know we're focusing on persuasion, but if you're doing of mice and men, and you're going to do an essay on Lenny, you know, Lenny was the most important character because, might be your thesis, and you're going to give me three reasons, right? He, he was a character that, that, that you, you know, brought out our empathy. His vulnerability made us compassionate. Whatever it might be, right? Hamlet. Hamlet is your topic. Was mad. Is a thesis. Was not mad. Could be a thesis. So on and so forth. So you can approach a piece of literary writing in much the same way by having your topic, who, who or what you're writing about, the position you're taking out on, rather, and your sequencing. So. Okay, so here we have, a little over to the side here, I hope you guys can see this on the, uh, on the um, screen, okay? This is something I put together. I've, I took old ones and I created my own format. So what this is, is this circle here is going to be your topic. So in this case, that's where you put American Revolutionaries. Below, where it says thesis, you would write, we're justified to rebel against Britain because. And then here's your sequence. They were denied Western settlement. They were forced to pay taxes without consent. And sequence three, um, they were threatened with violence if they did not submit. Okay. This section here are the details. Okay, now the more you put in here, the more prepared you're going to be when you come to putting your pen to paper in your essay. I tell my students, when you are doing this, because you will be doing this before you write the essay, and in most cases you will be doing this, and then writing the essay right after. So you'll, you'll construct your outline and then write the essay. I tell students, look, I want to see these five sections. I want your topic, thesis, and your sequencing. 
if you if you don't want to do this, you can get to that when you do the writing part. That's fine. The more conscientious, hardworking students will say, no, 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 Mr. Tolman, I'm going to fill all this out. I want this as thorough as possible so that when I write my essay, I got all my information right there. That's totally up to you. Okay. All right. So. For me, anyway, all the, all the essays that you're going to be writing in this class, other than maybe some paragraphs, if you do like a narrative paragraph, you, that'll be a take-home paragraph, but all of your essays are attached with unit tests. So, for example, Socials 11, you finish the Unit 1 package, you have to come into the, to my class um, in the Learning Commons, and you have to, you know, bring me Unit 1 package and be prepared to write the test and you're going to write a multiple choice portion and then you're going to do a written portion. You're going to do it right there, right in front of me. Okay? I don't do formal take-home essays because there's just too much room for over-editing, whether it be ChatGPT or whether it be Uncle Bob who's a literature major or your mom who's got a doctorate in philosophy or whatever it is. What ends up happening is that when everybody gets their hand in it and does a little bit of editing, the product that comes to me, oftentimes, is not the work of the student. Some of the ideas, of course, are, but all the, the, the grammatical structuring is not your own work. And what I want to do is to build your confidence uh, to write, to be able to say, hey, I've got a topic. I need a thesis, I need some sequencing, and this is how I'm going to organize my thoughts. So therefore, what I'm going to be doing is, is all your essays are going to be done in class. Okay. Learning to write on the spot is a very important skill. When you get to post-secondary, your, your exams oftentimes are going to be essays. Right? You gotta, you're going to be given some topics and you've got to be able to organize your thoughts and write an essay right on the spot. The essay is your own work and the skill will boost your confidence, absolutely. When you hand in your essay at the end of the block and I look at it, I see your handwriting, I know you did it because you did it right in front of me. The advantage for you is that I mark these things a lot, easier is not the right word, but I, I'm a lot less harsh on my assessment because I understand that you wrote on the fly. And that's not an easy thing to do, but once you can do that, you are really on the right track for sure. So that's what I hope to achieve, is that I, I help you with a format, I help you with a structure, and as a result, as you have success in that, you will uh, gain confidence. Post-secondary expectations and formats. Okay. Lastly, some of you have um, been taught a little bit about bibliographies, about how to cite sources, and things like that. In most cases, you know, for example, my kids who are also in high school, um, one of course who's, who's well beyond high school, um, you know, I've seen what they do and oftentimes a bibliography is copy and pasted um, web pages at the end of a project or something like that. My position on this is that my number one task is to help you gain confidence in your writing. When you go to Camosun or UVic or whatever other post-secondary uh, institution you go to, if you know how to construct an essay, then you are on your way. I'll let them tell you we do MLA format. We do Chicago style in history. We do APA in psychology. Then at that point you should be learning about citing sources and formatting. If you know how to write an essay, then just learning how to cite your sources isn't too difficult. If you go to college and you can't, you don't know how to write, and you know nothing about formatting an essay, there is a huge learning curve there. So for me, as, an, as a high school teacher, teaching you how to comfortably put your ideas together is number one priority. And the, and the citations, we will let the post-secondary folks deal with. All right, to conclude, um, this is a list of just useful transitions, uh, words that are basically going to... Um, punctuate the effectiveness of your writing. Remember that in persuasion, your job is to convince your reader that you are correct. You're confident. You've got a great thesis. You've got a good topic. You've sequenced it really well and you are going to convince me that your position is the clearest. Here are some words that you can use 
to accentuate that position. Clearly, you know, great one, decidedly, evidently, indeed, right, these are all great transitions. Obviously, for certain, surely, truly, undoubtedly, that's a strong one, There's without doubt, without a doubt, well, that's the next one, without a doubt, and absolutely, these are the kind of words that, you know, express great confidence, and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't be shy of being confident in your writing, right? There's no reason. Your position is the clearest, and you're convincing your reader that you are correct, right? Your conclusion should basically, now I'm, when I'm talking about conclusion, this is the final paragraph in your essay, right? So if we're looking at the five paragraph model, you've got your introduction, the one sentence, your three sequence paragraphs, and a conclusion. Like your introduction, I have no issue with your conclusion being one or two strong sentences. What do you do in the conclusion? Well, in a way, you are circling back to the beginning and kind of restating what you said at the beginning, or you're going to validate, you know, this is, you, know, you, you are going to justify and validate why you took the position that you took in your essay, okay? Some people like to make a prediction. It could be a little bit more open. You could make a recommendation. Uh, you could state a revelation of some kind, right? Or you could make, uh, or you can have a moral to the story, a moral to the argument is, okay? So, once again, in one or two sentences. So, so as you begin to traverse these waters of writing, just be aware that it is an ever-involving process, you know, I mean, gosh, I know when I did, you know, during my master's, you know, I was always re-editing, 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 and, and you, you know, you could edit forever, but at some point we've got deadlines and then your work goes in on that day.